Orta Science Webinar, Introduction to Restoration Banking for Natural Resource Damages on August 8, 2023 at 1600 hours Universal Time, recorded and organized by Samantha Foster and Microsoft Teams. Slide includes the USGS Science for a Changing World logo. The findings and conclusions in the webinar are those of the presenters and do not necessarily represent the views of DOI's NERDA program, the department including the trustee bureaus, or the United States. Although some of the presenters may be employees of government agencies, the ideas described herein do not reflect the policies of those agencies, and no official endorsement should be inferred on NERDAR. Contact Samantha Forster to be added to the distribution list at Samantha underscore Foster at IOS.DOI.gov. The presentation slides and recording will be available on the NERDAR website at www.usgs.gov backslash the centers backslash CERC backslash science backslash natural hyphen resources hyphen damage hyphen assessment hyphen and hyphen restoration hyphen NRDAR series includes 101 topics, best practices, and edge topics. Uh oh, it's official. We're being recorded. We are at the top of the hour, so we will go ahead and get started. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Samantha Foster. I do outreach and education for the Office of Restoration and Damage Assessment. Thank you for joining us today for the Orta Science webinar um, on the introduction to restoration banking and natural resources damages. Uh, this webinar is being recorded, so if you do not want to be a part of that, please go ahead and jump off now. We have an upcoming webinar on five weight completion. We have an upcoming webinar on 508 compliance later in August, and I will go ahead and send out those details and announcement once it's ready. Um, Hannah, I'm going to stop sharing my slides if you want to go ahead and put the slides up, and then Deirdre, um, you can go ahead and start introductions once those are up. All right, I'm still seeing Sam's slides. Oh, here we go. Jeff speaking. Nothing is being shared quite yet. All right, can you see the slides up? Let me know. When they come up. Okay. Still nothing? Not yet. Not yet. Sorry about that, folks. Let me exit and try again. Can you guys see my slides now? Um, I just it's, see a black yeah, it's, screen. Yeah, it's black at the moment. OK, let me let me turn over time. Sorry, folks. Yeah. It might be Teams, Hannah. I don't think it's you. I think it's being a little bit slow because it's uh, being slow admitting people into the chat. So all right, I'm just I turned off my. Big monitor and I'm ho hoping that Maybe now it'll come up, and I'm going to give it a second. Deirdre speaking. Maybe while we wait for it to come up, I could introduce the folks that are going to be presenting today um, and give a little overview of what we'll be talking about um, so we can keep it moving because we definitely want to hopefully have time for questions at the end. So <clears throat> let's get started. I feel very lucky today to be able to present the uh, folks who will be presenting on 
restoration banking for natural resource damages. Um, and starting for, first with Lauren Sanker. Lauren is a habitat restoration specialist with NOAA's Restoration Center. She has served in this role for 15 years, working on restoration planning for the Portland Harbor Superfund site, as well as other natural resource damage assessments and community-based restoration projects. Lauren is based in Portland, Oregon. Uh, then we also have Chris Playstead, who has been practicing environmental law for 23 years. Um, 18 of those years have been with NOAA's Office of General Counsel, Natural Resources Section. And Chris has been involved in natural resource damage cases nationwide under CERCLA, OPA, and the National Marine Sanctuaries Act. Chris is also based in Portland, Oregon. And we have Jeff Krausman, who has been a fish and bi wildlife biologist with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for 36 years and has been with the Washington Fish and Wildlife Office since 1991. Jeff serves as a trustee council representative on five damage assessment cases and also participates in spill response events. More recently, Jeff's work has been increasingly focused on restoration implementation and monitoring for success. Finally, there's me, I'm Deirdre Donahue. I have been with the Office of the Solicitor for DOI, Division of Parks and Wildlife Environmental Restoration Branch for almost 10 years. Um, I'm also based in Portland, Oregon, and my caseload, among other things, involves a number of CERCLA NERDAR matters in the Pacific Northwest. I'm gonna just take a break here and see how we're doing on the slideshow. Is there anything? Don't see it yet. So this could very well be a Teams issue. I see, Joe, you have your hand up. Oh, that could be a remnant hand, maybe. Jeff speaking. Yeah, of all Are of us, still? Deirdre, your video is pretty clear. I'm wondering if maybe one of us should try presenting. Sure, we could try that. Um, let's see. I will stop sharing. Okay, I've got the slideshow pulled up. I just don't have the right view for it. But let's see what we've got. Chris speaking. And and if we're having trouble with the slideshow and you want me to get started, I can just start rolling and then we can pick up the slideshow when we get it going. Either sure, and situation. I didn't even kind of give an intro yet, so I could certainly do that. All right, do folks see the oh, slides? That worked. Yes. Yep. Hey, yeah. hey, did it. Okay. <laughs> So, um, great. So, um, you know, today we are truly going to be covering a true introduction to restoration banking for natural resource damages. This is a topic that all of us joked we could talk about for hours um, because between all of us, we've done uh, quite a few uh, restoration banks. And we really wanted, though, for this discussion, because we know that folks are coming from very different experiences with restoration banking, um, because it is newer, some people don't have any experience. Some people may just have heard a little bit about it. And so we really wanted to just give a high overview for folks, along with some examples, so that if you come in contact with restoration banking for one of your cases, you will have at least a background to pull from. And so we're going to be highlighting the cases that we're working on that have some of those um, restoration banks, but then also we'll be looking at some of the concepts that when the four of us put our heads together, we said we see these things come up across the different examples we'll be talking about today. Um, so I'm going to uh, advance the slide if I can figure out how to do that. Introduction to Restoration Banking for Natural Resource Damages by Lauren Sanker and OAA Restoration Center. Chris Plasted, OAA, OGC, Jeff Krausman. USFWS Washington, and Deirdre Donahue, D-O-I-S-O-L, D-P-W. And hand it over to Chris. All right, good morning, everybody, or I guess it could be afternoon, depending on where you are, but it's, it's morning where I am, so good morning, good afternoon. Uh, thanks for taking some time to sit with us today and talk about restoration banking. Uh, before we dig into the details about restoration banking that Deirdre mentioned, let's just talk for a minute about what restoration banking actually is. Uh, here's the definition from the 2021 NOAA guidance document on restoration banking, and I'll just, I'll pause here for just a second so you can look at it. Any arrangement under which natural resource trustees agree to recognize and accept from a settling party restoration credits produced by a third party in lieu of payments of funds by the settling party or promises by the settling party to perform work. Um, 
the restor I don't think we have a slide specifically providing the restoration bank, but at least for the NOAA guidance, and I believe also for the DOI guidance, you can just do a Google search for it and it comes right up. So let's break down what that actually means. Uh, next slide, please. So in our cases, we see all kinds of different arrangements and how projects are developed. Uh, PRP may construct their own project. They may hire a contractor to construct a project on their behalf. A PRP may work with other PRPs to jointly build a project. But what sets restoration banking apart is that the work is undertaken by a third party and that the third party intends to sell those credits to PRPs at a profit. But we can also interpret what a third party is a couple of different ways. So you could have a, a third party that is truly a disinterested third party. In other words, a commercial developer who has no stake in the assessment other than just selling the credits for profit. You know, conversely, it can also be a PRP who's going to produce more credits than they actually need to resolve their own liability, and they intend to sell the ones that they don't plan to use for their own purposes. But the defining factor, again, is that the party building the project is planning on selling those credits to somebody else. Also, PRPs don't have to be the only market for those credits. You could also have trustees purchasing those credits, too. Uh, that could occur in a situation where, for example, the PRPs are given a cash out settlement opportunity and these still need some way to do restoration. We have to spend the restoration funding that we got through the cash out and buying restoration credits can be a way to do that. Now, before moving away from the definitions, I just want to draw a quick distinction between restoration banking and mitigation banking. We hear these terms used interchangeably quite a bit, but they are not the same things. They actually have under different statutes. They have different legal frameworks. So just as a general rule of thumb, whenever you're talking about the banking process associated with a natural resource damages case, the correct term to use is always going to be restoration banking. Slide, please. So why do we want to do restoration banking in the first place? Why is it good for the trustees? Why is it good for the public? What's in it for us? Uh, the short answer is that it isn't always going to be the best solution. That is a very case specific issue. And part of what we want to do today is to arm you with the kind of information that you're going to have to have to start thinking about whether or not restoration banking might be a good option for the case that you're involved in. But assuming that it is a good option for you, uh, let's take a minute just to acknowledge that restoration banking isn't always going to be the most intuitive concept to the public. Uh, after all, you know, how can we compensate the public with a project that's already been built? I mean, I kind of get that, and it, it feels a little bit emotionally unsatisfying. Ultimately, though, I think the better framing for the issue is that if it wasn't for the possibility of the bank sales, then the project never would have been built in the first place. So in other words, if the public's already experiencing the benefits of that restoration, they're doing so all well before the completion of those settlements. And that's pretty huge. And that could even be before the assessment itself is even completed. So the, the public is getting these benefits well in advance of any of these other big milestones. Now, beyond that, there's also a number of other significant benefits to restoration banking as well. Uh, one of which uh, is that these projects are often built by third parties that specialize in restoration. In other words, these are the folks that are the professionals, and they usually have a pretty good idea of what they're doing. It also means that the trustees don't actually have to do it. Um, I will say we are good at a lot of things in trustee world, but I also think it's fair to say that we're not always the most cost effective solution when it comes to large scale restoration and often that's something that these third party developers can get done so these kind of restoration projects also tend to get done earlier and they're also tend to be larger uh, so the restoration banks tend to be large because they kind of have to be they generally need to be larger so that they're able to provide the number of credits that are marketable that they can be sold by the developer to the parties who may want to buy those credits and a larger project is also going to be producing more environmental benefits. So it's more profit for the company, but it's also more environmental benefit for the public. And like I mentioned earlier, they also tend to get done at an earlier point in the process because in order to take advantage of that market that's created by the potential settlements, the banks have to be there and have available credits when the PRPs are out looking to buy the credits. 
Now, finally, uh, the restoration bankers also may have access to attractive restoration locations that the trustees don't necessarily have. We've actually seen situations where landowners prefer not to engage directly with the trustees, uh, whether that's because of some kind of philosophy about government interactions or bureaucracy or whatever it is. But as private companies, restoration bankers can actually sidestep, sidestep some of these problems that trustees might see. Next slide, please. So with all that in mind, here's what we're going to be talking about today. Like Deirdre said, we're going to be taking the 30,000 foot view, or maybe this is even a 100,000 foot view, I'm not sure. But we do want to give you a little background Ground on some of the things that we thought were key topics in this subject. So we're going to talk about valuing restoration banks. How do you value them? We're going to give a few banking case studies that we can speak to during the presentation. And then we're going to get into some of the key restoration banking concepts like the role of the trustees, multi-purpose banks, uh, how to maintain long-term ecological value, and we're going to touch on restoration planning as well. And with that, I am going to hand it off to Lauren. Much, Chris. So yeah, I'm just going to talk about valuing restoration banks for a moment here. And habitat equivalency analysis, or HIA, as we often call it, um, is a model that's often used in natural resource damage assessments to determine how much restoration is required to compensate for injuries. So folks in attendance here, if you work on many natural resource damage assessment cases, you're probably familiar with HIA as it's been used quite widely. Um, in cases across the country. And it allows for quantification of both harm and benefits of actions over time, discounting benefits that are going to take longer to accrue, discounting benefits that occur in the future. And this ability to be used on both the injury and restoration sides of the equation and quantify the harm or benefits over time makes HIA a great tool in NERDAs. And the HIA metric um, is a useful unit of measure rather than acres or linear feet of stream or some other unit of measure that might be used in some of the other types of mitigation that exist. So the output of the HIA is a unit of measurement that we call a DSA, a discounted service acre year. And a DSA represents the value of all the ecosystem services provided by one acre of habitat in one year. And in these restoration banking project examples that we're gonna talk about today, a DSA is equivalent to a credit. So when we talk about a credit, we're basically talking about a DSA from the habitat equivalency analysis that was conducted on that project. So a responsible party might have X number of DSAs of liability, and then they can purchase X number of DSAs of benefit from a restoration bank. And let's move on to the next slide and we can look at a little bit of a visual representation of the habitat equivalency analysis. Oh, the slides don't look like they forwarded on my end. Yeah, they're up, Lauren. We can see them. Oh, yeah. Yeah. so you might have okay. a delay. There's just a lag. <laughs> OK, so here we're just looking at an example of HIA polygons um, at a restoration site. And so um, with the habitat equivalency analysis um, on a specific restoration site, we're looking at what the pre-restoration condition of a site was and then comparing that to the post-restoration condition of the site. And the difference between those two is the amount of value that the project provides. And the habitat equivalency analysis might be rerun over the life of a project. Um, so in the case of some of the projects that I have worked on, we have run the habitat equivalency analysis during the conceptual design phase. We've also run it um, to document and confirm what the as-built conditions and as-built value of a project is. Um, it might also be run, uh, rerun as the site develops if things change from what were planned. And then uh, run also prior to the end of the project, prior to the project being released from further obligations, um, to really confirm what the final value of the project was. And I also wanted to note, just in, in looking at a picture here and, and talking about habitat equivalency analysis, that habitat equivalency analysis is not necessarily the end-all be-all of um, recognizing or requiring value on a restoration project. So in the cases that I've worked on the most, um, HIA is not the only way that we're confirming value present on a site. 
Uh, we require additional um, things like habitat complexity structures or long-term stewardship or you know, other aspects of things either on the ground or in terms of policy that don't get reflected in the way that the habitat equivalency analysis works. Um, so the way that we look at it is that project consistency with the goals and objectives of our restoration plan, that comes first. And then this evaluation method comes second to get a quantification and a number we can use. Um, so HIA can't do everything and we really don't want folks gaming the HIA to maximize the number they get. We wanna maximize the true ecological function of the site. And this leads me to the next slide on habitat equivalency analysis um, or sort of feeding into um, habitat equivalency analysis. So having this metric um, that we use, these DSAs, um, allows us to determine the total value for a project. And it then also informs our use of what we call credit release schedules. So using the habitat equivalency analysis, we estimate the total number of credits that the project might be worth. And like I mentioned, that might be ground through several times over the life of the project. Then we develop a credit release schedule to, de to describe the milestones that must be met in order for the credits of that project to be recognized as available for sale. So the credit release schedules that I've used include a combination of legal, financial, and ecological milestones. And in the case of the example that's on the screen here, for instance, 15% of the credits in this project would be released prior to construction, but once the property was protected and financial assurances were put in place. An additional 35% are released when the project is actually built and you've confirmed that it was built as designed or you've modified the value of the project to reflect that things changed. And the remaining credits are then released throughout the next 10 years of the project's life based on performance and some additional financial and long-term stewardship obligations that come up towards the end of the project's performance period. Year three performance standards credit release 30%. Year five performance standards credit release 10%. Requirement, conservation easement, long-term stewardship fund and plan. Year 10 performance standards, year 15 and 20 lamprey monitoring credit release 10%. So just wanted to cover a little bit there um, about the way that we've been using um, valuation tools to come up with what credits are on a site and introduce this credit release schedule concept. Thank you, Lauren. So now we are going to turn to a couple of case examples. Um, both Jeff and Lauren are going to present before we go into um, some of those restoration bank concepts that Chris talked about in the introduction. So Jeff, I am going to uh, turn to you. Thanks, Deirdre. Um, we've got several examples from the state of Washington to show you all. Um, most notable is the Port Gardner Bay case where we were able to <clears throat> build the Blue Heron Slough. This is a 353 acre site is enormous um, for which a third of the site was used to settle energy claims from settlements in 2018 and 2019. Um, dikes were breached essentially where the tidal restoration process was restored for this site that used to be an estuary and was used for farming uh, up until now. Um, this estuary and habitat supports actively um, our salmon resources, bull trout, mic birds. Um, it's, a, it's a fairly enormous site and one we're um, really thrilled about that was basically constructed or at least the dikes were breached in 2022. Next slide. In the Elliott Bay Duwamish River case, there's two notable banks that are active right now. The T117 site along the uh, the uh, Duwamish River is one of several that the Port of Seattle um, has built in terms of uh, using a site that was cleaned up. This one, this active site was potentially built for settlement purposes, but um, is going to be used primarily for additional settlements from other parties at this point but it's a fairly large site. It's about 14 acres. And this was also completed in 2022 or last year. Next slide. Elliott Bay Duwamish River, 
Vernus White Place Restoration Site 1. The last one's kind of a smaller site. It's about two acres. It was constructed back in 2013 by a third party consultant working with the city of Seattle. Um, the site was built and then transferred to the city of Seattle for um, its use of um, settling its NRD claims as well. There were other sites proposed, but because the third party consultant um, is no longer a viable party, um, they were not. And uh, essentially, those are the three that I wanted to bring to everyone's attention in the state of Washington. Thank you, Jeff. Mm -hmm. Okay, now Lauren is going to discuss a couple of restoration banks that she's been part of. Yeah, next I'm going to show you some examples from Oregon. Um, I'm going to show you some slides on each of four restoration banks that have been constructed to provide habitat for fish and wildlife um, injured by contamination in the Harbor Superfund site. So these four projects um, are Alder Creek, Linton Mill, Harborton, and the Rainierson Natural Area. Um, there's a lot more information about each of these projects and the Trustee Council's larger restoration goals and objectives that are all available on the Trustee Council's website for folks who would like to know more. Um, for today, I'm just going to mention these projects, show you some nice before and after images, and talk a little bit about um, who's involved and what the restoration entailed. Alder Creek, Windlands, Linton Mill, Restrocap, Hardwarden, Portland General Electric, Rinerson Natural Area, Columbia Restoration Group, Let's move on to Alder Creek. So Alder Creek is a 52 acre site um, within the Portland Harbor Superfund site. Um, it is a former lumber mill that was acquired by a company called Wildlands Incorporated who um, now owns and manages the property and who constructed the project. The project was constructed from um, 2014 to 2016 in a, in a staged manner. And that means that it's currently in year eight of its performance period within Portland Harbor. We have a 10 year performance period that we're um, placing on all these projects when monitoring and active adaptive management are occurring. And here you can see some before and after images of the site. Um, when they constructed, they removed over 300,000 cubic yards of fill from this area to excavate the side channels that you see in the after photos. And um, an oak upland was established on the far side, um, kind of in the upper left of that uh, after photo, um, along with riparian and marsh habitats, um, in addition to these side channels that were placed, um, and thousands of native plantings were installed as well. We can move along to the next site, and I'll just show you Linton Mill. Um, this site is uh, owned and managed by a company called RestorCap, um, who acquired this property that had been sitting vacant for about a decade for sale um, with, without much luck being used for other purposes, but was acquired by this um, restoration banking company. They constructed the project in 2017, 2018, and 2019. Uh, in total, it's about 26 acres, so a little bit smaller, but still quite large for, for the setting in this very industrial harbor where this work is occurring. Um, the project's currently in year four of its performance period. And at this site, it was also a lumber mill, a plywood mill, actually. And so a lot of um, very large structures, um, including the large lumber mill at the top right of that before photo, were removed from the area. Um, demolished, uh, about 700 pilings were taken out from the shoreline. And this off-channel habitat, um, kind of C-shaped off-channel habitat, was excavated um, along with removing fill from the riparian and floodplain areas that was all placed in an upland area that's in the top right of the after photo. And this area was also um, very fully planted with thousands and thousands of, of native plants. And we can then move on to look at the Harborton Restoration Project. Um, so this is a 53 acre site. It's actually right across from the waterway um, from the Alder Creek site, so very close. Um, it was constructed in 2020. It's a property that's long been owned and managed by Portland General Electric. 
and uh, they have a substation on the property, but also have some really uh, nice established wetlands that provide valuable habitat for native frogs. And they decided to excavate a tributary um, that connects those wetlands to the main river. And I uh, also um, excavated quite a bit of floodplain, moved some of that fill to create a small upland area, and then thoroughly vegetated these um, newly created areas with native plants. In this site, there's a lot of established habitat that was already present, most of kind of the left-hand side of the photo that looks really nice and green. Um, and so there's a lot of invasive vegetation management going on, as well as um, preservation of the wetlands that provide that uh, native frog habitat. And an interesting note on this, Portland General Electric happens to be a potentially responsible party in the Portland Harbor Superfund site, and yet they decided to serve as a restoration banker in this case, um, not to resolve their own liability, uh, but to sell credits from the project to other potentially responsible parties because they had this asset and this opportunity. And we can then move on to the last Portland Harbor example, which is the Rainierson Natural Area. This is the one site that is actually outside of the Portland Harbor Superfund site. The, the Trustee Council for Portland Harbor identified a broader focus area, we call it, where restoration can occur. And so one of the four restoration banks that have been built thus far is in this broader focus area. Um, the Rainierson Natural Area is a 33-acre restoration project that's managed by a company called the Columbia Restoration Group. Um, they constructed the project in 2017 and 2018, so it's currently in year five of its 10-year performance period. And um, the construction of this site mainly included removal of an earthen dam that had been built in the 1990s to create a big ponded area. That dam was removed. Um, there is still a grade control structure, so the pond that's there was shrunk down to be quite a bit smaller to reduce uh, water temperature issues, but still maintain habitat for native turtles that have um, taken to this area and are doing quite well. So native turtle habitat management is an ongoing component of the, um, of the management at this site. They also excavated the channel downstream and re-meandered Rainierson Creek upstream from this channel. Um, the area was also revegetated with natives and in areas where there had been disturbance. And like the Harborton site that we just talked about, um, the, there's a lot of existing habitat on this site. And so um, ongoing maintenance of that existing habitat is needed. Here in the Northwest, we have a lot of issues with um, invasive vegetation. And so invasive vegetation management is ongoing within those um, existing habitats as well. And that's it for me on the Portland Harbor examples. Deirdre speaking. Okay, so we're going to now dive into some of the key restoration banking concepts. Some things that when the four of us put our heads together, we said, you know, these are some things that we've seen on each of the restoration banks we've been involved in that came up pretty early and were consistent themes throughout. So we are going to dive into those to give a little more detail on each of them um, because we feel that these are um, things that if you do come across restoration banking in your own practice, there'll be themes and concepts that'll be helpful for you to be familiar with. So the first is the role of the trustees. And you know, to be honest, this is going to look different depending on the specific facts of your case. Um, and so what we've seen in comparing our notes is that really it's up to the trustee council to decide what makes sense given the facts and their own resources um, when it comes to being involved with um, a restoration bank's development and oversight. So what we can see is sometimes a very, very active involvement where the trustees are taking a role in the development of the bank from the very beginning. Um, it hasn't been constructed, constructed yet. It may be a concept that was identified by the trustees and a restoration banking comes banker comes forward and says they're interested. Um, and you may work together to do a wide level of planning to provide assistance with, you know, here are the things that the trustees are looking for in terms of ecological values and how that fits into the design. They may also be, um, you know, longer term in this type of a very active participation role, the trustees or an individual trustee taking on the roles related to long-term stewardship, um, 
a lot of trustee oversight in the years after the case, uh, the restoration bank is established. Sometimes, though, we can also take what um, we call the traditional role, which is that there's a little less um, active trustee participation, where there may be a restoration concept that has already been fully um, scoped out and designed by a restoration banker. They're really bringing an almost finished product to the trustees and saying, hey, are you interested in this? We had this great opportunity working with such and such landowner. And the trustees can you know, review it, say, how does this stack up with our own restoration goals, the ecological values we're looking to achieve. And there may be a little bit less trustee involvement there. There also may be less um, involvement in the trustees taking a super active role in doing long-term stewardship, doing long-term monitoring. Um, but that all said, at the end of the day, it is up to natural resource trustees to make sure that the bank that they have purchased credits with or accepted credits from a PRP that settled with them um, maintains and achieves the ecological values that the trustees have accepted in compensation. And so we're going to talk a bit more in some of the subsequent slides about some of the mechanisms that the banks we've worked on um, have been developed to ensure that ecological value is achieved and is maintained. The thing I do want to highlight, though, is that we've already talked about the credit release schedule, and that is one of the important ways we do that, where as trustees, we make sure that there are specific milestones, whether they're financial, legal, or ecological, that are met before uh, we recognize the value of a particular credit. Chris speaking. Right. Before we jump into some of those mechanisms that we might use to ensure long term benefits, let's talk a minute about multi purpose banks. Uh, when I say multi purpose banks, basically what we're talking about is banks where there are multiple crediting regimes that apply to an individual bank. And each of these generally requires a different kind of certification by the banker for their project to make sure that they can get credit under whatever regime it is that they're interested in you know, participating in. Just a couple of examples of this. Uh, one of them is restoration credits. That's what we're talking about here today in your natural resource damages cases. Another one is Clean Water Act wetland mitigation credits, and those are approved by the Army Corps of Engineers, and the trustees are not involved in those. There's also Endangered Seas Act conservation credits. Those are generally going to be approved by natural resource agencies like NOAA and the Fish and Wildlife Service. And you've also got some other just general you know, local uh, versions of crediting schemes that might apply on in a, a, you know, one situation or another. So for example, in Portland, the city of Portland approves what are called floodplain mitigation credits. Essentially, if you wanna do a development project somewhere within the, uh, the, the floodplain in Portland, then you have to show that you're going to come from somewhere else in that same floodplain. So basically there's a, a no net loss of floodplain uh, capacity. Now, one thing I'll add is that we actually like to see banks that have multiple crediting schemes that are applying to their bank. Uh, it, it adds some more complication for the trustees, but it actually is a good thing for the bank overall because it's going to make it more likely that a, a banker is going to be able to sell the credits that they have. And bankers that can sell credits are going to have healthy banks and healthy banks are going to be more stable and be able to provide those ecological benefits better. So we actually like it when this happens. But a couple of key points that you need to make sure you're thinking about if you have one, one of the people crediting schemes. The first is that there has to be a conversion. So for example, uh, one restoration credit might equal two conservation credits under the ESA. That's just a simple example. And it can be very easy or it can be very challenging depending on the circumstances. So in Portland Harbor, we have a bank that is both Clean Water Act and uh, Natural Resource Damage Restoration Credit uh, certified. And in that, both of the credits were valued identically. So it was an easy one-to-one -one conversion, no problem at all. It was a lot more complicated in Port Gardner where we had to, uh, we had uh, certain areas of the project were available to one, but were not available. To, and so we had to use a common current, cur excuse me, a common currency. And in Port Gardner, we chose acres because that was the way that the thing that we felt was the most commonly convertible between the two. So you might have had one of one credit was worth 3.75 of the other credit. Also in Portland Harbor, uh, we had reanalysis of Archaea 
to accommodate the floodplain mitigation credits for a couple of the projects that I mentioned earlier. So we had to come up with a conversion there that was not a simple one to one. So there are ways to do this. Uh, sometimes it takes a little bit of creativity and looking at your HIA and figuring out what makes the most sense, but it can be done. And again, it can be a very beneficial thing to those banks. But bottom line is regardless of the credit type that you're talking about, you can't have double selling. You can't have double or double counting, depending on how you want to use the term. Uh, once a, so a credit has been sold for one purpose, you can't sell that credit again for another purpose. All right, next slide, please. Now we're going to get back to that issue of how to maintain the long term ecological value of the projects. So this is a critical challenge in restoration generally. It's making sure that we get those long-term benefits for as long as we anticipated them when we came up with the crediting that led to the settlements that we're talking about. And it's important because if the project doesn't perform as it's expected, then it's not going to provide the benefits that are necessary to compensate the public. In other words, again, the thing that we settled for. So just like any other restoration, this problem that exists in the restoration banking world. But fortunately, like Deirdre said, we do have a toolkit that helps us make sure that the projects do perform over the long term. The first thing is the trustees need to consider the performance period. And um, Lauren talked about this just a little bit. It's the time from construction through or up to long term stewardship. In other words, it's the time period where the project published. It's proving that it's progressing the way that the developer promised and that it's going to provide the benefits that we're interested in. And like Lauren said, 10 years is what we used in Portland Harbor. Uh, it's going to vary case by case. It really is going to be case specific, but that's a pretty good you know, idea of the order of magnitude of years you're talking about. It's going to be it's going to require enough time to make sure the project is actually performing the way that it was anticipated. So making sure that this actually that the performance period goes the way we were hoping includes a couple of different components. The first one is going to be maintenance. So generally as part of the approval process for the bank, as you're looking at the restaurant and deciding whether or not to approve the bank, you want to see the developer provides a maintenance plan on how they're going to be doing the basic maintenance for the project. That's the the day to day stuff going in and make sure that the weeds are pulled and you know, whatever else has to be done is being done. But we also have to have a way to make sure that the project is actually providing the intended benefits. And that's where the, the performance criteria come in. And again, as part of the restoration plan, when you're deciding whether or not to approve the project, is making sure that the trustees are comfortable with the performance criteria that are laid out in that restoration plan. So the trustees are going to be checking this performance under these criteria to make all kinds of decisions. So in other words, is adaptive management necessary? Is the bank failing and we have to go in there and get something else done? Should we approve a credit release under a credit release schedule like the one that Lauren showed earlier, et cetera? So these are the kinds of questions that, that we're working to those performance criteria and the monitoring results to make some really important decisions. Now, sometimes the project won't be performing entirely the way that we expected that it will. And that's when we have to turn to adaptive management. Again, something you want to build into the initial or make sure that the restoration project developer has built into the restoration plan. And it's also a good practice for the trustees to build into that agreement a feedback loop that gives us an opportunity to see what's happening and to have some influence in what those adaptive management decisions are going to be, because we do want to have some visibility. And we prefer, I think generally, not to let this entirely rest in the hands of the developers, but have some influence, some ability to drive what it is that they're doing for adaptive management. And then finally, when the performance period is over and the project has proven to be effective, transition into your long-term stewardship period. Often this is going to go off into perpetuity. Uh, that depends a little bit on the specifics of the case in the project, but here in the Northwest, that is generally the way that we approach this. Although it's generally funded by the developer, unlike the performance period, it's not a given necessarily that the work is going to be all undertaken by the developer. Another alternative that happens from time to time is the trustees negotiate a scenario where the developer hands off that long term stewardship to a third party, such as a station organization, or it could be the developer that does the long term stewardship as well is really again going to be a case specific thing. But the main point there being we have to have these mechanisms in place so that once that project goes off into the sunset, so to speak, that it's going to continue to provide those benefits for as long as the trustees bargained when they came up with the, the crediting scheme and the settlements that are using those credits. Next slide, please. 
Deirdre speaking. Okay, so I'm here to talk about legal documents, everyone's favorite topic, right? Um, so as we've alluded to throughout, there is definitely a legal aspect to this as well. Um, and, you know, we want to make sure as trustees to the kind of some of the points people have been making before, that we capture the responsibilities that are associated with the party's roles at the site and making sure that we have mechanisms through some of these legal documents in place that ensure that the projects, these restoration banks are going to continue to provide the ecological value that we need them to in order to compensate the public when we accept credits from them. So there's various types of documents that may be necessary. It's gonna depend on your case, but these are some examples of the types of legal documents that have come up in the restoration banks in the Pacific Northwest that we're talking about. So we have memorandums of agreement. Typically these are um, these MOAs are entered into between trustee council members and uh, restoration bankers to kind of dictate the rules of engagement between the trustees and the restoration bankers, um, talking about you know how they're going to work together if there's you know particular tasks where the trustees are going to provide input. Um, these are typically all in a memorandum of agreement. The next thing that we often see is conservation easements or other types of property protections. So just like your traditional restoration project, for these restoration banks, we want to make sure that the underlying physical footprint is subject to restrictions that ensure that the physical footprint will not be subject to future uses that are going to conflict with the ecological values that you recognize as a trustee council and that you want to be established over a certain period of time. The other thing too is that we've been working with the Department of Justice on um, consent decrees that accept restoration credits from these banks is very important that these restoration bankers, if they're in that situation where they have, there's a consent decree where a PRP is offering credits from their bank to offset their NRD liability, that those restoration bankers are aware and ready to sign the consent decree. Um, there's often terms in these types of consent decrees that have restoration credits that require specific performance of um, different milestones associated with the restoration bank like, for instance, having a, a transition to long term stewardship when the time is right, conducting adaptive management to keep the project on course. And so having bankers sign on to consent decrees provides another mechanism to ensure that they're doing what they've committed to. And finally, one of the things we often see are escrow agreements and other performance guarantees, which I'm actually going to get into in a bit more detail on the next slide. I want to just highlight because of this, um, the level of kind of documentation you want to have to make sure that you're avoiding risk associated with it and preparing um, the credit, being in a position where the credits from uh, a restoration bank are going to be something that can be integrated into a consent decree. If a PRP decides they want to purchase credits to offset their liability, it's very important to have attorneys involved from the start of discussions about whether or not restoration banking makes sense for your particular case. So as I said, I'm going to do a little bit of a deeper dive here about performance guarantees, which are a subset of the legal documents you'll often see on these cases. And so the performance guarantees really tie to some of the other slides we've had here where we're talking about how do you as a trustee know that this third party banker is going to complete the obligations that you need them to over the very long term to make sure that those ecological benefits are realized that you're counting on for compensation. And so one of the things that trustees often turn to is having financial assurances that secure funding to complete various important milestone activities along the way. And so it can start with restoration implementation, then followed by the maintenance, the monitoring, and the long-term stewardship. And so there can be pots of funding secured by various financial assurances that will ensure that there is enough money available that could be accessed by the trustees if needed to do each of these major uh, activities. What will often happen is there's a mechanism, whether it's a letter of credit, a bond, or an escrow account. These are all typical types of performance guarantees that we see. They will secure an amount of money 
that the trustees think is appropriate associated with the particular activity, whether it's long-term stewardship, maintenance, or monitoring, or restoration implementation. And it remains in place and available to a beneficiary, typically one of the trustees, through the period of performance of that activity. And so if a restoration banker during that period of uh, the activity performance fails to perform, the beneficiary trustee is able to access the financial assurance and the funding associated with it to finish the work and make sure that the ecological value associated with that activity is actually realized um, for the restoration bank. And so this is one of kind of the important mechanisms that over time has really become uh, a backstop to making sure that if things went south with a particular restoration banker, the trustees still have um, a way to try to mitigate that risk because we have funding to do the work ourselves if we need to. Finally, I'm just going to touch very briefly on restoration planning and NEPA here. So I am not here to tell you a stepwise approach on how to handle restoration planning and NEPA for restoration banks. I don't think there is any you know, uniform blanket approach where you first you do A, then you do B, then you do C. It's really going to depend on the facts of your case. Um, but I want to just highlight that if you are thinking about restoration banking as part of your NERDAR, that you are still as trustees going to need to comply with the appropriate restoration planning requirements under legal authorities like CERCLA and OPA. And for federal trustees, you will still need to comply with NEPA. So when you're thinking big picture about how could restoration banking particular maybe fit into my uh, case, you do want to think about what does it also mean for my restoration planning and NEPA process. And again, just like uh, with the legal documents, you really do want to coordinate with your case attorney to make sure you talk about your strategy for making sure your NEPA and restoration planning obligations are met. And as I said before, it's really going to depend on your case. You know, if you have a case where and, you know, accepting restoration credits from a PRP is just one of a series of restoration actions, or if you've done, you know, um, some initial restoration planning and, and NEPA documentation already, versus if this is the only action that the trustee council is going to take is accepting restoration bank credits, you know, it's going to look very different. I just want to highlight that restoration planning in NEPA is part of your process, but it is really going to depend on the facts of your case exactly what that looks like. So that was our last slide. Um, and so I think we're, we've are we got about 10 minutes left, which is great because we were really hoping that we have an opportunity to at least answer some questions. Um, I'm going to end the slideshow so that folks can um, see each other and I can see people. Right on, and we can, oh, fantastic. Thanks so much, Deirdre. Um, this is Hannah from Orda. Um, as we transition to this question and answer session, I invite folks to drop any questions they might have in the chat or raise their hand. Uh, I'm seeing Tosh McClure has a hand raised. Do you wanna go ahead, Tosh? Yeah, hey folks, been a while since I've seen some of you. Um, so uh, I had a question that it sort of came up um, through the response side at Hanford, but it um, also was seemingly being proposed to include NRD, and that was they were discussing the potential of having a federally owned and operated mitigation bank, um, and that was something I've never run into before, and so I was wondering if that's something, you know, from the panelists, if you guys have seen that anywhere of a, of a federally owned and operated mitigation bank because it seemed to re raise a lot of big questions for me about you know, how that works and what OMB would think about having something like that and just a lot of like kind of things that would make it kind of hard. So anyways, just wanted to see if you guys have seen that at any of the sites you've worked on. Deirdre speaking, Beaver is a light, a pale skinned woman with short curly, dark hair wearing glasses and a plaid shirt. Well, Claire, it is so good to see you. I've only heard your voice the last couple of years. Um, you know, that is super interesting. Um, you know, I haven't come across it in my experience. And again, too, it's a mitigation bank, it sounds like, not a restoration bank, uh, hence the terminology. So really our presentation in my experience has been, because I'm a nerd art practitioner, has really only been with restoration banking. Um, but that is super interesting. And maybe one of my um, co-presenters has seen something um, along those lines. 
Lauren speaking. Lauren is a light-skinned woman with long braided medium brown hair wearing a button-down blue shirt with a t-shirt. Hey, good to see you also, Laura. It's been a little while. Um, I, I have not seen anything along those lines in the Portland Harbor examples that I can speak from, but it does sound potentially like that kind of a structure might be more similar to like permittee responsible mitigation. And that is something that is fairly common. Not It's kind of like like a PRP led project in the natural resource damage assessment case, but sometimes you will see entities that um, like here within the state of Oregon, not, not a federal entity, but like the Oregon Department of Transportation will build large bank projects that they then know they're gonna have multiple actions. They need to basically you know, offset over time. Um, and the only other thing I'll add just in that vein in terms of awareness is that I do understand there to be um, some uh, mitigation banking being considered or possibly implemented on BLM or Forest Service land, so federally owned land, but I don't know whether or not that is um, actually being managed by the federal agency or whether or not there's a third party involved. Again, though, that's outside the natural resource damages context, um, but those are just a few other points that might be places of interest to do some more exploration to learn more about federal agencies' roles as, a, as an implementer and manager of a bank. Yeah, and, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. And it's been, been a while since I've seen you guys. Hope you guys are doing well. So thank you. Hannah speaking. So for the next question, let's transition to the chat. Uh, a few have come in and a few from Jonathan Taylor came in when uh, you folks were discussing these restoration banking case studies. So we've got um, a question regarding these case studies. The question is, were he has performed um, on these sites? Did the HIAs result in an estimate of credits? And if so, what were the credits generated from these sites versus the acreage? Lauren speaking. I can share from the Portland Harbor example again, um, if, if you'd like. Um, so definitely HIAs were performed on each of the four uh, restoration bank projects that I presented on. Um, I, I don't have specific numbers in front of me, but I might can share a little bit about kind of scale. So, you know, some of those sites we looked at, um, let's take the Alder Creek example, for instance, um, that was like a 52 acre site and the total HIA value for that site is currently estimated around 700 DSAs. So 52 acres to 700 DSAs is sort of the difference there. Um, in the Harborton project, I think, it's a similar acreage, but the DSA value is more like, um, uh, I think closer to 500 or 600 DSAs. So there's not a direct relationship at all between acres and DSAs. The habitat equivalency analysis is its own you know, analysis methodology for documenting value. And it really has to do with change, not just total area, but how much is occurring and, and changing in that area over time. Um, and that's actually a great segue to just mention something briefly that I didn't get a chance to cover at all, but um, the information on the, the DSA values um, and the number of released credits and uh, number of sold credits and all that sort of thing um, for the Portland Harbor Restoration Banks is all available in the um, Army Corps of Engineers database that is used for tracking um, banking transactions across the country under all sorts of different authorities. It's a system that was mainly developed for mitigation banking, but has been adapted to also um, cover in lieu fee banks and um, banking under other authorities. It's called RIBITS, the Regulatory in lieu fee and bank information tracking system. And um, there is information within there about the DCA values of different sites um, that might be of interest to folks. Thank you so much. I don't know, much, Jeff, Karen. if you want to. I was just going to, I wasn't sure if Jeff might want to add anything from the uh, Washington examples. Jeff speaking. Jeff, a light-skinned man with short gray hair and beard, wearing glasses and a patterned blue shirt with an image of a lighthouse in his background. Yeah, I was just thinking about T-117 and Elliott Bay Duwamish. Um, the trustees provided the court with a basically a letter that established what Rhonda? we... Oh. Um, sorry, but we, we provided the port... Um, what we believed was the value through the HIA process for them before they even built the site. So they had the ability to sell credits 
from that site if they chose to for NRD um, with the idea that the trustees had already given them a nod and had valued the site through the HEA process. So um, that's certainly an example for, for us that we've done ahead of time before the site was even built. Deirdre speaking. And just to be clear too, they still had to meet other milestones like we discussed, but Correct. we gave them an estimate of what we thought based on HEA the uplift from what the site currently was to what they were designing. Now, that's just an estimate. You know, as Lauren mentioned, there are lots of points along the way that the trustees verify using, at least in our experience so far here, to understand the um, ecological value that the project provides. And one last thing, too, over time, if the site is not performing, um, there could be a change in that value, and that was understood too, and is being understood by the board. Chris speaking. A pale skinned man wearing a plaid button down shirt, headphones, and glasses with pictures hanging in his background. That question also reminded me of one little interesting historical note about the Port Gardner project, Blue Heron, that Jeff had talked about earlier. And that was we actually conducted two different HIAs on that project because it actually started its life as a salmon conservation bank under the ESA. Uh, so this is a project that the Port of Everett had developed quite some years earlier and had coordinated with NOAA on and so it developed this plan but had never actually put it into place because I guess they just hadn't had the funding available to, to do the project. And so they had this fully formed conservation bank. When we got involved in the natural resource damage assessment with them, the came and said, we've got this project already. We've got a plan that we think you guys might be interested in. The trustees looked at it and said, well, this actually looks really good. This thing is accomplishing a lot of the same things that we would like to do. But of course, we had to do our own HIA on it to make sure that it was covering all the same species, all the same resources that we were interested in. Um, and as I mentioned in the part about multi-use banks, we actually decided that there wasn't the same benefits for all the species we were interested in as under the conservation bank, which is why we needed to develop that conversion factor between the two, but we actually did that as a result of two different HIAs that were performed on the site. Hannah speaking. Thanks so much, folks. Uh, we're running up against the hour. I guess I might uh, ask one more question of you folks. There's a question in the chat from Natalie Wilson around incorporating environmental justice into some of this work. Uh, so the question is, is there a strategy for incorporating environmental justice or a socioeconomic factor? Lower socioeconomic communities tend to be disproportionately affected by environmental degradation. So if we weren't including in uh, one of these sort of an environmental justice factor, banking could unintentionally inequitably distribute the, the positive effects of restoration. You guys have any thoughts on that? Lauren speaking. I'm, I might just go back to the concept that I, I mentioned um, when we were discussing HIA about the fact that your larger um, restoration plan and restoration goals um, should be the driving factor for assessing which sites and location of sites and whether or not banking itself is even an appropriate mechanism, um, given the needs of the community, the needs of the species, and, and all of that. Um, you know, for example, in Portland Harbor, we did come up with a geographic policy for where restoration could occur that really focused restoration happening where the injuries occurred and where we do have the most, um, I, you know, the highest population of communities that have been impacted negatively over that contamination over the decades. And so there was a, a strong driver to have those sites located in that same area and not this place, you know, far, far away where the benefits wouldn't get to go into that same community. Um, so I think having, a, a, you know, having your larger plan and goals and objectives identified and then making sure that the, uh, and those could include um, social justice or environmental justice goals. Um, that's some of how I would think about it. Jeff speaking. I think it's, very similar to the L.A. Beige Walmish case as well, especially with T117. It's exactly the same thing. It's, the board has recognized, certainly in the trustees, that this certainly gets at that social justice issue. Sorry, Deirdre. Deirdre speaking. No, I was going to say, I think this just all segues into the point I made where just because you have a restoration bank opportunity, you still have to run it through your process as a trustee council for restoration planning and NEPA, right? And so to Lauren's point, 
you know, you're going to be thinking bigger picture about how does this particular restoration bank and the actions it's putting forward, how does that actually fit with the things we as a trustee council need to accomplish? How does it fit with our compliance if you're a federal agency with NEPA? So you're not just kind of saying, oh, well, it's a bank, so we'll take it. You, you really do as a trustee council have to do a pretty um, thorough analysis on all kinds of levels. Um, and again, that's why it's going to look different for every case, but you really do want to start thinking about those things um, right away. Hannah speaking. Thanks for these thoughtful answers, guys. This is a great discussion. Um, I'm going to hand it back over to Sam Foster, who's going to close it out for us. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks, everyone, for joining today. Um, Jonathan, I saw your question about contact information. Uh, I can loop back with you after this call. Um, so thank you, everyone, for joining us today. We look forward to having you on our next webinar. Have a good day. Thanks, everyone. Have a good one. Thank Bye, you. Everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.